So welcome to this edition of LinkedIn of 22nd Century Management with Kim on LinkedIn Live and on YouTube Live. Uh, we have with us today Stephen Howard. He is the author of. Uh, oh, you're gonna have to give me the book name. I just went right out of my head. That's okay. Better decisions, better thinking, better outcomes. Yes, there we go. Uh, better decision, better thinking, better outcome. And we're going to be talking today about mindful versus mindful uh, decisions. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, so, Stephen, you know, get us started. Actually, one question for the audience. Do me a favor. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, I always like to know where the audience is, is uh, joining us from. So you can make that in the comments on LinkedIn or on uh, YouTube. Um, so, Stephen, give us a little bit of your background, how you got to, to started toward writing this book. All right. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be on your show today. I graduated from Las, uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, is where I grew up, in the western part of the United States. And the uh, company hired me, Texas Instruments, sent me overseas to Singapore. And I ended up changing companies a few times. I uh, lived in Singapore for 21 years, then Australia for 12 years, and then back in the United States about uh, seven years ago. And uh, my dad was a fiction writer, and I decided to try my hand at nonfiction writing. So my first book came out in 1997, published by a British publisher when I was living in Singapore about corporate image management. And I've been writing books ever since. Okay, well, very interesting. Um, and, and I love the, our discussion today because uh, just before the show started, we were, talking, we were talking a little bit about my challenge with between those two. Um, so in your book, you have a section about uh, brain myths. So what are some of the brain myths that you were surprised to discover in your research? Well, the first one, and I, I swear I learned this in high school, my high school science teacher taught me that our brain stops growing somewhere around age 25, and, and now scientists pr can prove that that's not true. We continue to grow new brain cells well into our 60s, into our 70s, perhaps even to our 80s. There's just not enough 80-year-old and 90-year-olds around to test, so our brains can continue to grow. and. Um, and also what also amazed me is the, this concept of being right-brained or left-brained, and it's not true. Our, we use both parts of our brain, not all the time where we burn our brain up, quite frankly, but, uh, you know, for instance, you know, you and I talking today, language, I, my left part of my brain is listening to your words and translating your words, and then the right part of my brain is putting it to contact. So both sides of my brain are, have to work together in order to have a conversation. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of times people use it in the term of left brain dominant or right brain dominant, not necessarily that you're not using both, but there are people that are artistic, and I am not one of those. Those are people that can deal with putting words and ideas together, which is more of the thing that I'm, uh, let's say, reasonably competent at. I wouldn't say I'm great at it, but I'm reasonably competent. My mom would say I couldn't draw with a, you know, a straight line with a ruler. So. Exactly. Uh, the, the other interesting myth um, is, 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 is actually true. It's not a myth so much as that our, the back part of our brain does develop quicker. So the amygdala, which is the emotional control center, develops quicker than the prefrontal cortex, the, which is our rational control center, which is why teenagers make emotional decisions and make bad decisions. But as I point out in the book, when we get angry, when we get emotionally hijacked, that back part of our brain is taking over the amygdala and we're not making good decisions. So effectively, we're running our businesses with a teenage brain. And I don't know anyone who wants to run their business or even their life with a teenage brain. So that's something we should be aware of. Well, you know, and, and that's interesting because, you know, we talk about it um, in, in the sense, you, you know, if we get upset, but I think that fear may pay a part of that too, is because we, if we're in a situation where we're thinking about doing something that's scary, you know, sometimes the, the fear emotion takes over the logic side of it and, and we back off from making a decision. And it's funny, I think that, and, and I'll throw this out as a, as a premise and you tell me what you think of this. Because one of the things is that people that start businesses, obviously, you know, that's a fearful thing, starting a business, you know, taking that leap to start a business. Uh, but then I see it seems like in time that people, after the business starts to achieve a little bit of um, uh, stability, that then that fear kicks in anytime they think about changing it, you know, and it tends to, I, I, I use the term, it keeps them in a rut, you know, it makes it very hard for them to think about changing to something different, even though 
there might be huge opportunities in making the change. It's just the, getting out of that comfort zone. Well, absolutely correct. And, you know, the fear is a factor. This is the same part of the brain. The amygdala is, is our fear factor, controls our fear, and, this, and helps us decide whether to, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. Uh, and, but making, not making a decision is a decision. And I think people have to realize that. So when you, when you say, I'm not going to make a decision, I'm going to postpone it. Well, that is a decision. Yeah. Uh, there's no question about it. The uh, uh, getting stuck in a rut, uh, uncertainty. Um, we as human beings, we like certainty. Uh, we're comfortable with certainty. We want to, and, and so that certainty of, okay, I've got a business running, things are going fairly smoothly. I, I'm afraid to change because I'm not certain what will happen if I change or if I venture off in a new world. That's something everybody, entrepreneurs and leaders are going to have to learn to deal with right now because change and amb ambiguity, I mean, nobody can tell us what's going to happen with the pandemic. You know, we're, we're what, September, 18 months into this thing. Are we going to go into more lockdowns? Are we not going to go into lockdowns? Are we going to have a different vaccination? Who knows? Is going back to the workplace, is it going to work or is it not going to work? We're going to have to learn to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. And that is going to be a skill that all of us have to develop and uh, work with. And that's not going to be easy. It's scary. Well, it is. You know, and, and it's funny because I am what you would very much call a serial entrepreneur. You know, I I tend to to change what I do at times. Um, and this is probably my fifth or sixth business that I that I have running now, and I am I'm running two at the same time right now. You know, and and people would say that's not very smart, but th that's just the way my brain is wired. And I, I you know, yeah, it's like okay. I pretty much got this in a groove, so let me go find something else, you know. <laughs> but I don't deal well with boredom either, so uh, maybe that's the ADHD. Hold on, I got a comment. Let me see where we got somebody watching from. Hi, Jennifer. Thanks for joining so much. It's nice to see you. We had such a great conversation when you were on the show. Oh. Um, I like it. I love it when past guests come in and join the show. Absolutely. So that kind of takes me to, to my next question for you. Um, what are the overall steps when we should be taking really to, to build and to maintain our brain? You know, we want to, to make our brains healthy and flexible. And um, so what are things that we can do to make them that way? Well, that, that's a great question, Ken. And, and it's a, such an important question in today's world, quite frankly, because I know a lot of people I talked with and before I did the research for the book, they thought you know, Alzheimer's is Alzheimer's disease. You know, I'll worry about Alzheimer's when I retire. And while there is a DA, DNA component of Alzheimer's, there's almost like two branches of Alzheimer's. There's those who are genetically disposed to it. And then there's those who, because their lifestyle, get exposed to it or increase their risk for it. And same with dementia, which Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So quite frankly, the things we do in our 30s and 40s to our bodies and our lifestyle impacts our risk for dementia in our 60s and 70s. So what can we do? It's, it's basically everything is good for the heart. It's good for the brain. The brain is the biggest user of oxygen in our system. So exercise and, you know, you don't need to run marathons and half marathons, you know, 20 minutes of aerobic exercise, walking or something, you know, four times a week is a good start. Um, reduce weight. Men who pack on the most abdominal fat in their 40s have the highest risk for dementia in their 60s. So if you're not in your 40s yet, don't put on the weight. If you're past your 40s, get rid of it. Uh, and, and, you know, there's an old Chinese proverb that says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Well, the best time to think about your brain health was in your 30s and 40s. Uh, the second best time is now. So if you're past your 30s and 40s, get into it. Um, Lower your cholesterol, lower your blood sugar, lower your BMI, all, all the basic things that we talk about in terms of our heart health is what we need for our brain health with one addition. And that would be some mindfulness practices and getting out in mother nature, just reducing our stress. And while yes, stress can impact the heart, I think stress impacts the brain even more, particularly in today's world. So meditate if you want to meditate you don't have to go into yoga you don't have to become a buddhist uh, to become mindful just take some time off take a nap just take some thoughts go outside mother nature is the best doctor we have look at the birds look at the trees get some fresh air and think about just think about mother nature and don't think about the things that are stressing your life so that that's what we need to do 
you know, and that's interesting because I find, you know, like I said, I, I tend to overload my plate a little bit anyway, and that that when I'm I get stressed, that then it then it becomes really, you know, you start to it um, becomes very hard to accomplish anything. And and you're talking about going outside. I, I have a fig tree, and in, the, in my backyard, the fig tree makes figs, which is really nice. We have a constant battle between me and the wasps to see who's going to eat the most fig. <laughs> And they're they're winning, but I so you know when I'm stressed, I go out and I pick, look for figs on the fig tree, or I I have a big garden and I go out and get the hoe and I kill weeds or I do something, you know to to that's not stressful. In fact, my my wife would say I stand out there and watch the garden grow sometimes, and that's okay too. Yeah, five minutes. You know, like, uh, I tell leaders, I mean, stop back to back meetings if you have to have back to back meetings and run your meetings for forty five minutes. Uh, and then that gives you five minutes to kind of collate what you've talked about in the meeting, you know, do a follow-up memo or email, whatever you need to do. Then spend five minutes just chilling out, listen to music. Uh, if you can't go outside, look outside the window. Um, uh, but don't look at your phone. <laughs> don't look at any messages. Just take five minutes to let your brain tune out and then five minutes to prepare for the next meeting. Because quite frankly, when you run back to back meetings, you know, you finish a meeting and then you brought off, off to the next Zoom call or even back in physical meeting days, you're going to the next conference room and have a meeting. For the first five or six minutes, your brain is literally still digesting the previous meeting. So your brain is not fully there in the first five or six minutes, which is why often you'll be saying something that's a little, you ask a question and it was covered in those first five minutes. Uh, or you'll say something, well, how come this is not on the agenda? They said, well, we went through the agenda and it is on the agenda. You weren't paying attention. You might have thought you were paying attention with your eyes, but your brain wasn't. Your brain was off somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> been, there, done, been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, I would say part of it is 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 also the presenter. We had, uh, when I was, <laughs> I was attending a tech school for one of the manufacturers that, that I worked for because I spent, uh, uh, about uh, 20 years working for copier manufacturers. And in, in the first class I, for the new manufacturer, um, I handed my classmate a note. He was a, one of, he was my peer. And, and I, I handed him a note. I said, please kill me now because we had a, a instructor that was reading the PowerPoint word for word and every handout he read word for word. And I am like, just make this pain stop. <laughs> But but yeah, I've been there. I've been there where I, you know, you just your your brain kind of goes off into left field, and and part of that uh, is is me, I know. And, and I do want to say hi to Scott. I had the privilege of working for Mr. Scott Chatton a long, long time ago, and he's probably a, one of the influences that got me where I am today, sitting here doing what I do. Uh, mm -hmm. It's good, nice to have you with us, Scott. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things that. You know, you get, especially if you start, at least with me, I drift into thinking about other fires that I've got going on. And like I said, you start to, to, to lose focus. So that is a, is a, a definite challenge. Um, and I want to go back to what you said about the, both your health. I think the other piece of it for people that to do well into their advanced years is the fact that they keep their brains active as well. I think that, you know, and this is my opinion, you know, I think about the people I've known that have been very sharp in their 90s. They were people that never stopped learning, never stopped, you know, doing things to keep their mind involved. And I think about the, you know, because I have had experience with uh, two cases of Alzheimer's in my family, a case of dementia in my mom and my wife's family, and well, actually two cases of dementia there as well. And, and I think that they were situations where people stopped learning and stopped. I think that was an in, at least a factor in what happened with that. There's no doubt about it, Ken. Um, and you know what? It, it, the brain likes to learn new things. I mean, so for instance, one tip I give people even today, if you're in the 40s or 50s, when you start going back to work, or even when you go grocery shopping, take different routes. You know, we all get in our cars, we go the same highway, we make the same journey. We just kind of zone in and zone out and drive to, to, to the office or to the shopping center, or to, you know, to our, uh, a friend's house, whatever. The brain's not active at that time. We want to take a different route and notice that, oh, there's a new, sh there's a new store over here. Oh, this person painted their house. Oh, look at that tree. You know, there's flowers blooming over here. The brain likes new stuff. 
So even if you walk, you go out for a walk, and typically most of us take the same pattern when we walk, take a different route or, or take the same street, walk in the opposite direction this time and see what you notice. So the brain likes to be refreshed. And the same goes when, when you're elderly, you're right, keep the brain active, but it has to have some variety. If you only do crossword puzzles, then you get very good at crossword puzzles. And after a while, your brain's not developing, it's not making those new connections. So do crossword puzzles for four or five months, uh, do jigsaw puzzles, do Sudoku, do, you know, do different things, learn a language, learn an instrument, um, anything like that, keep the brain fresh and you've got a better chance of having a, a better mental acuity in your elderly years. Yeah. It was it was funny when we were in the, in in the military. Um, I worked in a unit that had a lot of people that would would retire out of that unit, and the the standing joke was is that the average retiree lifespan was about five years, but most of these guys were like, "I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna sit around and not do nothing." And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I I, I I'm not well. I'm I'm almost sixty nine. And I am have no inclination to retire. You know, like I said, yeah, yeah. I just keep finding more things to do. But if part of it is, is they do they're very different things. Exactly. You know, because as I teach, I do interviews. I you know, I I do. I mentioned to you, and for those in the audience that don't know, I have a travel video channel as well. So I, I stay busy with a lot of things. I garden. You know, so my mind is always has a new challenge, a new something to think about, work on, and I think that's uh, so important. It's critical. It's very important. You know, and going back to what Scott said in his message here about how this is timely, it's very timely. Before the pandemic, the American Heart Association and the American Medical Association, I think it was, projected that Alzheimer's in the United States and, and dementia and stroke would increase 67 percent between 2020 and 2030. We'd end up having 10 million Americans affected by stroke, Alzheimer's, and dementia in 2030. Well, those numbers are only going to go up because of the pandemic. I mean, prolonged stress has a really negative consequences on our brains, and we, all of us have gone through prolonged stress now for 18 months. And so I can yeah. only guarantee those numbers are going to be higher in 2030. So Scott's absolutely right. This is a timely, timely issue, something we should all be talking about. Okay, so your book title intrigues me, and is that most people would think uh, that better thinking leads to better decisions and better outcomes, but you focus on the other way around. You say better decisions leads to better thinking, and then better. Why is that? Thank you, Ken. I love I love that question. I think you're the second or third person that's asked me that question. That's picked up on that. The reason for it, quite frankly, is the first decision we need to make. So that's why I called it better decisions better thinking, better outcome. The first decision, the better decision is not to allow ourselves to get emotionally hijacked. And when we do, and we've all, all of us have said at some point, I was so angry, I couldn't think straight. Well, that's true. You you couldn't think straight because you're angry that those the cortisol being flooded into your brain from the amygdala, um, without a doubt, is making you not able to think straight. So the first decision, the better decision is don't get stressed, control your emotions, ask some good questions, uh, put things in context, ask people, it's so simple, like, well, what would you do in this situation, Kim? That will calm yourself down, let other chemicals come into your body, put you in a more relaxed or better state to make better decisions and better outcomes. And the other reason for this, Kim, and for your audience to be aware of, when our brains are stressed, when we are emotionally hijacked, the brain likes to protect itself. So the brain goes into what we call binary decision-making mode. So it only looks at two options, A or B, black or white, yes or no, this or that. Often we have to make these really important decisions. You don't want to limit yourself to two choices. You want three, four options. You want to think about combining A with D and, and creating E as a fifth option and, and, and looking at different options. But under stress, the brain only, only tries to give you two options and tries to force you into making a less than optimal decision. So better decision, get yourself under control, look for options that will give you better thinking and that will allow you to have better outcomes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and and I see that I am fortunate that I'm not prone to getting mad very often, but I have been very angry a few times where it's, the end result's never been good. Um, much more so when I was younger. It goes back to that, you know, <laughs> that younger um, but let me add, Ed, if I, or Ken, if I may, um, it's not just negative emotions. 
being too happy. Look, I grew up in Las Vegas. I can tell you why hotels keep getting built in Las Vegas. You get on a winning streak and you think you're so happy, everything's going well. And of course they give you a few free drinks on the casino floor as well. And you're elated and everything. And I can't lose. And I, you know, you've won $5,000 and you're, you don't make the smart decision, the better decision to walk away from the table. You go, I, 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 I'm hot, I'm hot. I, and you, the, the house is gonna win long-term. And the house doesn't mind when people win short term because they know that you know 97 percent of the people are going to gamble it right back and then add some more oh i was hot i'll get some more money i'll buy some more chips so happy emotions are emotions just like anger is emotion so you know and i hadn't thought about that but you know and that's probably that probably affects a lot of people in in ways that they that they don't even think about your your, your comment about uh, the um the chemicals in the brain is it reminded me of um, Leaders Eat Last uh, by Simon Sinek, and he talked about in in leadership, you know, in 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 that when you're managing and leading a team, that there are things that the way you interact with your team affects those same, you know, the same things, uh, you know, in their in their brain, and uh, you know that makes sense that it would the same would be true with the uh, emotions. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, look, leaders who are micromanagers, uh, who wants to go to work and be micromanaged other than maybe, maybe a new college graduate who's just soaking it up like a dry sponge because they're learning everything, everything's new to them. But most people don't go to work and want to be micromanaged. But then if a leader comes in and micromanages people, that causes stress. Those employees, those team members now are going to have the, the negative cortisol going through their system. And it, it they're not happy, they're less productive, and it impacts the relationship between the leader and that employee, that team member that they're micromanaging. And entre entrepreneurs are really bad at this, quite frankly. Entrepreneurs, when they're under stress, because it's their business, I mean, you know, look, it's their capital, sometimes they mortgage their house. I, you can understand them getting stressed and getting worried and getting nervous and getting fearful, as, as you talked about at the beginning of the show. If they start micromanaging, then they are really going to hurt themselves because they don't have a lot of employees usually to rely upon or partners or business partners or even suppliers. So you got to be really careful about letting stress impact how you make decisions. Well, you know, and, and it's interesting. I think that micromanagement, you know, I think there, it goes hand in hand with the stress mm -hmm. because it, 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 I do believe that a manager that is micromanaging is insecure. Or fearful. I, I think that's a symptom of insecurity, which then insecurity causes stress on you. Absolutely. Uh, and I, I, and this is one of the things that I, I talk to my the students in my class all the time about the fact that it is their job to train up their replacements, because that's how they get promoted is by training up their replacements. So many people that micromanage are so worried about maintaining their position that they'll never move up in the company because they. They don't have anybody that could replace them, you know? And, and that's, the, I, I often tell people the worst thing you could ever hear in your career is, Ken, you're too good at what you do. I can't afford to replace you. I can't afford to move you up. I can't afford to promote you because there's no one to replace you. And now you get stuck, you get locked in and that's bad. Yeah. And, and then of course that, like I said, it, it creates a, a negative attitude in the workplace, which reinforces the micromanagement piece of it. Yeah. I think that, you know, and, and we were talking about entrepreneurs, the, the hardest thing for a lot of entrepreneurs to do is to start making that transition. And I, I work with uh, copier dealers for, I, I supported copier dealers for, like I said, 20 years uh, almost uh, for the manufacturer. And in talking to owners a lot of times, what I would see is they were stuck in the entrepreneurial mindset where they had to have their fingers in everything. Yes. And the real key to long-term successful growth, I think, is that ability to kind of relax and, and, and delegate out to managers because then the, the owner starts to have the time the, to start working on his business rather than in his business. Absolutely correct. Same thing with managers. I mean, today, look, no man, nobody in the leadership position can know everything. And I think a true leader has to have the courage to be able to stand in front of his or her team and say, you know what? I don't have the answer. I don't know. Let's work on it together. Let's decide together how we're going to solve this challenge or this opportunity or this situation. 
But so many people are afraid to say they think that once they get promoted into manager, you know, that title, manager, supervisor, they think that I now I have to have all the answers and I have to give all the directions. Everybody has to do it my way. And that's a bad, bad mindset. And be, you become an ineffective leader. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I thought I think it was Steve Jobs uh, that made the quote. I, I saw it recently. And in fact, I might have shared it. But it was uh, made the quote that, you know, that why would you hire really bright people and then tell them what to do? Exactly. Exactly. You know, if you hire really bright people, let them tell you what to do. And, and again, I think that's one of the things that, again, in, in from the management and leadership side, that is such a challenge is the, the A, the feeling you need to know all the answers and, yeah. and B, the, the feeling that you have to control everything. Oh, and you can forget about control. Control went out the window um, in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. You, you can't control people when they're working from home. I mean, hard not to control when they're in the cubicle next door to you or out in front of your office, but control's gone out the window. Control and command's gone, guys. I mean, uh, and you know what? One of my favorite phrases right now, you and I are both baby boomers, I take it. So, um, and, I, and a lot of people I coach and, and mentor these days is, are in that baby boomer age is when I say, you know what? Go back this weekend and watch Star Wars and watch, watch Yoda tell you, you must unlearn what you have learned. And now let's talk next week about how you're going to be a different leader going forward. Yeah, well, and you know, it's, I, again, it goes back to that learning thing because part of what I did when I was starting putting my course together is I had to read a lot of books. I was like, oh, wow, I wish I'd have known this then or I wish I'd applied this better. Um, yes. And it was interesting because in the in the class I teach, one of the first books I read when I started my dealership, and this would have been 30 years ago now plus, uh, was The One Minute Manager. And, you know, it, it is a very simple book. Three simple principles, yep. and it still applies today. In fact, it's part of it's required reading in my advanced in my class, you know. Uh, and so is the Simon Sinek Leaders Eat Last book, mm -hmm. and what was some others. But you you think about it is is that sometimes it's the simple things that we stop doing, you know, and then we start to make things more complex, more difficult when it, yeah. it's really not. Okay, so let me let me ask you another question. In the book, you talk about leaders need to be first responders in the workplace. What do you mean by that? It goes back into what we talked about a little earlier about not um, getting emotionally hijacked. So when I, I lived in Asia, I lived in Asia for 21 years, and I learned to scuba dive when I was there, and um, I got certified up to rescue diver. And the first thing they teach us in rescue diving is when someone's in the water yelling, help, 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 you don't just jump off the boat and start swimming to them. You don't know if there's fishing nets on the surface you could get tangled in, if there's jellyfish, stingrays swimming around, if the current is different on the surface than what you know would know it to be underneath the surface. Uh, and of course, you know, everyone's concerned about sharks, but that's usually the least of your worries. But So we're taught to respond, not to react. And in the business world, you know, we run around 24 seven as leaders, we are, we're paid to make decisions. People come to us and ask for immediate decisions and we react. We tend to react to people, events and situations. And so what I'm trying to say is don't react, become a first responder. Just like our EMTs, when they come across a, a car, bad car accident, they don't jump out and run to the car. They look, are there electrical cables that have been knocked down? A power pole has been knocked down? Uh, can I get electrocuted? Is there smoke? Is there gasoline spilling around? They do the same thing. That's why they're called first responders. And so what I'm trying to encourage people to do, particularly in their personal life, but even in your professional, uh, sorry, particularly in your professional life, but even in your personal life, pause, take a deep breath, take a couple deep breaths. Don't, don't respond and give an immediate uh, sorry, don't react and give an immediate decision. Ask a couple of questions, think about it. If you can, buy yourself some time. And somebody says, hey, what do you think about this situation? Tell them, you know what, give me 15 minutes to think about it. That's what, that's what I need, I'll come back to you. And then think about it, reflect on it, and you'll make a better quality decision. You'll make a more optimal decision. Um, so that's what I mean by be a first responder, not a first reactor. Yeah, and I love that analogy. I, I, I learned to dive as well. And, you know, you, you think about it, the, the worst thing in the world sometimes 
if you've got a panicked person in the water, you get too close to them. <laughs> because, you know, now, now you're going to have to deal with them and, you know, whatever their problem was. You know, you, you're better off to keep a little room. Is this their, survival, their survival instinct kicks in and they try and drown you or try and take your, take, take your scuba um, uh, regulator away from you so they can breathe. Well, no, 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 this is my air. <laughs> this is my air. I need it. Yeah. I'll, I'll share it with you. That's how we're, what we're taught. We're taught how to buddy breathe, how to share that air, but you can't take it all. <laughs> share it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting though, how some of those things come into play. But again, I, I could see that, you know, the, because again, I, and it's one of the conversations I have with the students in my classes. Uh, it is so easy to become reactive. And I talk to them about it in, the, in a little different mode, but the, about the difference between firefighting and fire prevention. Mm -hmm. You know, because fire prevention, we want to we want to be uh, even um let's say proactive rather than reactive, you know, trying to think about, okay, what's, what's causing the, the situation. Let's go back to the scuba diver or the swimmer in the water. What is the, what is the problem? Exactly. You know, before we jump in and start trying to rescue them, let's figure out what we need to rescue them from. And, and also make sure we take our right equipment. I mean, I, I've seen people jump off the boat and forget one of their flippers. And you, you and I know how difficult it is to swim on the, in the ocean when you only have one fin on. Yes. Uh, that, that is very definitely a challenge. You know, so all of these things, you know, and, and I, I agree, I can see where the, the uh, taking the buying out the time to, to, to reflect on whatever it is that you're having to face would, would make a big difference in, in how you, um, how you make decisions. Yeah. So now, go ahead. I was going to say, I'll tell you a quick, real fast story. I was on vacation with my girlfriend a couple of years ago, and, and um, this is right when COVID began. And she had a situation, we were driving in the car, she had a situation, her son wanted her to do one thing, her mother wanted her to do something else. I'll be honest, I had, I had a third thing I wanted her to do. And she's driving, trying to make a decision. And I could see that she was getting to this binary decision mode that we talked about earlier. She was just freezing. She couldn't, I said, darling, please pull over. Just pull over the side of the road. Let's talk about all your options. And we, we sat there for I don't know, 10 or 12 minutes. And I said, look, you can do what your mom wants, you can do what your son wants, you can do what I want, uh, what you want, uh, combine some ideas, let's just explore some options. And it, that, it, you know, at the end of that conversation, um, she got on her phone and, and called her called her mom and son and said, this is what I think we should do. It, it, was a, it was a solution that satisfied both her mom, her son, myself, but most importantly, it satisfied her and it was an optimal decision. But, you know, she wasn't in that mode until I actually made her stop and pause and think about her options. Yeah, and, and again, that's a, that's a great story. Of, and it illustrates well the, the, the point about just stop and think about what's up, you know, mm -hmm. and, and don't let our emotions drive because our emotions are notoriously bad at driving us into to, to bad habits, bad problems, you know, uh, lots of things. Um, okay, so I'm assuming that if people went to look on Amazon for your book, they could find it there? Well, hopefully, yes. I don't think it's out of stock. <laughs> so, yes, it's on Amazon in both print and Kindle version. Uh, if they want to contact me, you know, they, I see the email address there on the screen, but uh, uh, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. Uh, email me, Stephen, at calianteleadership.com. Caliante, as you probably know, is Spanish for hot. But the second definition of caliente is passionate. And I've got a conversation caliente is a passionate conversation. So I'm passionate about leadership. I'm passionate about leadership development. So reach out to me. Okay. And I will. Do, what I will do is that will all be in the LinkedIn, uh, either in the discussion section or in the, I'll post it as a comment. I'll post a link to his book. I'll find a link for you on Amazon. So it'll be there for everybody. If you're watching on the replay, do me a favor, go ahead and, uh, if you're watching it on YouTube, hit the like. And if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, do me a favor and hit and subscribe. I'm trying to get to 100 subscribers. So that way I can get my channel name. That's, that's my big goal for my you YouTube channel. It. Get a name rather than uh, a sequence of letters. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening on the podcast or on LinkedIn, you know, again, there'll be show notes there that'll have the his contact information. Thanks so much, Stephen, for being with me. I really appreciate it. It's been a fun conversation. Uh, when you write your next book, we'll be back in touch and you can, and we'll have a conversation. Uh, we'll do that. I started last week, so we'll talk to you next year. <laughs> but it's always nice talking with you, Ken.
Okay, well, let's say goodbye to our audience and you can hang around with me. Um, so goodbye to everybody. Thanks for being with us. Uh, glad, I hope you enjoyed it. We've enjoyed having you. And we'll see everybody not next week. Next week I'm off. I'll be uh, out of pocket, but week after next, I hope to be back. So we'll see everybody in a couple of weeks.